Well, we're going to move from those verses, 14 through 18. Those verses will not leave our thinking through the remainder of the book. Uh, and they were probably even laid on us uh, in the previous verses. We're going to move on through uh, the text in Philippians chapter 2, beginning and picking up the reading in verse 19, and we'll make our way through verse 30. In the reading, this is this is a piece of the letter that shows us some of the endearment that Paul has to his companions who are suffering in the cause of the gospel, along with his his uh, desire to be with the church in Philippi. So we get some real personal interaction. We hear Paul expressing some things, some real personal things in his in his love and his his desire for the church. In Philippi, so we get to we get to be people who just get to take a look back in time and a relationship between the apostle and his beloved church in Philippi, and so we'll look at it in this way. And there are some treasures and some benefits, some things that uh, I, I don't mean to imply that that, that that there's any part of these verses that are lesser or more important or significant. But you'll see it as we're reading through it. Some of this will show the conversation. Some of this will just show the affection. Some of this will show the, uh, the interaction and the, des the great desire that the apostle has for the church in Philippi. And some of it will be, will be profoundly helpful for us as a church. Verses 19 through 30. Follow along uh, with your eyes landed on those treasured words breathed from God himself, delivered through the Apostle Paul. Verse 19, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of a kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interest, not, not, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was going, he, he was longing for you all, and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking for his life, or risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. So there's two people that the apostle brings up and he introduces one to us and we're already familiar with another. Uh, I think that that's sweet in its own right. One thing that can get missed many times in the, in the, in the comings and the goings of, of churches is that we have a tendency to place the popular in the word uh, up and we, we look at them as the heroes and indeed they are and I don't think we ought to place them in any place different in the observation of who they are and the benefit that they are to the church but as well we get a snapshot into the life of a well we could say lesser known and probably had your pastor thought it would be that you would receive it well and I think you would have so I should have done it and I should have put out a pretest of explain to me who Ep Epaphroditus is and I wonder how many of us would have even known that, th that his name is ever even mentioned in scripture 
certainly if you've been following along and you've been reading the text in advance, uh, which, I, which I'll take a moment, the sidebar moment, and just say this, that I commit to you as a good idea. You know that unless, unless directed differently by the Lord in the course of the coming days, the next piece of Scripture that I will pick, that I will pick up for preaching will be Philippians chapter 3, at least verse 1. But why not go ahead and read on and become as familiar with the text as possible? And I would say that would be a helpful thing for you to do. It would be a good discipline to be in because that's, that is essentially the pattern of which I preach is verse to verse along the way. And so you, you don't, don't just look at that as, well, I, I know where he's going to pick up next week and you're satisfied with that. I do that for multiple reasons. I think it's helpful for us to see the continuation of the text, but I think it's also good because it gives you moments to let the word resonate and marinate in your heart and in your mind along the way as well. So, I'm done with that little soapbox for a moment. And back to here. We would likely fail the test just on the cold turkey fly of the moment. Hey, tell me what you know about Epaphroditus. Even I would have to say, I would probably struggle to begin digging and reaching into my memory banks of who are you talking about? Are you talking about some Greek person? Are you talking about some Greek god or goddess? I don't know. Who is this Epaphroditus? And, of course, the good Greek scholars in the room are, are chuckling under their breath because that preacher can't, can't pronounce names properly. Um, and so my pronunciation of this man's name might be enough to throw you off to begin with. <laughs> don't know who you're talking about because that's not how you pronounce his name. But, but in, the, in, the, in, the, in the beauty of this, we are introduced to a brother in Christ who is loved by the Apostle Paul and has a close relationship with him. And the Apostle Paul has two important things to say to the church in Philippi about this brother. And we'll see that. And you, you likely can even identify it pretty quickly and easily. But let's, let's, let's address the issue with Timothy, the good issue with Timothy in regards to the church in Philippi. We already know that Timothy is a part of the church planting work in, uh, and the establishment of elders in the churches that Paul establishes. And so Timothy is a well-known man in the Bible. There's even two letters that Paul writes that are included in the scriptures, in the canon of scripture, a first letter and a second letter from Paul the Apostle to Timothy. And so already on the surface, we have an understanding that Paul and Timothy have a very close type of relationship. Paul even refers to him as a son. And here he refers to Timothy considering him as his father in a fatherly way in his relationship and his care for me is like that of a child caring for his father. And so we, we can see that there is a, a, a seriously beautiful friendship, brotherly, father-slash-son type of a relationship between the two. So it certainly isn't the kind of, of relationship that is severed uh, that, that sometimes happens between a father and a son. This isn't that kind of a, of a relationship. This is the kind of relationship where the two desire to be in conversation with and in work with and in ministry with. Paul is seen. It wasn't long ago I was speaking at a, a conference down in, uh, in the Ogden area of churches in the, in the northern Utah region, and I was introduced uh, by the 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 director of missions and so that that's somewhat language that may be missing on some of us in our day to day but the director of missions in that region I've known for several years and I was introduced to the the brothers the pastor brothers at that conference as a father type figure to him well it did a couple of things for me it shook it shook me a moment because I'm not that old <laughs> But I do have two grown sons, and so it is. And there, and uh, and this director of missions or church planning catalyst is about the age of my oldest, and so I suppose he was accurate in saying that in regard to my age, but also in the friendship and the camaraderie and in the intimate dealings of the church work in the region that we have together. This is that kind of a relationship that Paul is speaking of concerning Timothy. 
And so we, we see that Timothy's interest in the church of Philippi, we look at it in verse number 20. We see that this isn't just an academic exercise that we want to do today. We don't just want to look through the text and academically pull out a few things. We want to see the intimacy. And then we want to be in position to live in this kind of a position with one another. But we do see in verse 20 that Paul or that Timothy has had and, and, and is a part of the intimate work of the work in Philippi. In verse 20 he says, Paul speaking, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Paul's saying there's no one I know like Timothy who loves you like I do. He, he, he says some things that on the surface looks like it's part, perhaps a slight against other pastors or other, other missionary journeys in the, in the verses around this, but we, we don't need to read that as that because he's going to then come back and introduce us to an individual, a, a completely unknown individual to us, Epaphroditus. But Paul's saying, there's nobody I know who loves you like him. Now, now I love you, and I have a great affection for you, and I want to, I long to be with you, but I can't. Because I'm forbidden. I'm, I'm under house arrest. So I want Timothy to get to you because I know of nobody in all of the world who loves you the same way that I do. This Timothy. I want him there with you. And so Timothy, Timothy is devoted to this church. And, and in verse 22, you also would learn that not only is Timothy devoted to the church in Philippi, but Timothy is devoted to the apostle. And you see it in the words of verse 22. Again, Paul the apostle communicating this to the church in Philippi. But you church you know of his that's timothy you know of timothy's proven worth you you know it firsthand you you know it because you've been you know him you've been around him you've heard him you've seen his work and so you know that it's so this is a proven wealth proven worth of him and you've seen him because he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father so Paul, Paul communicates this devotion that not only Timothy has in his love and affection for the church, but he also communicates, and this is showing, this is showing the, 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 person, the personality of Paul. It's showing his personal affections for the church, but it's also revealing to us the necessity that he has of a companion in the gospel work. And, and, and so Timothy is devoted to, to Paul, and he's, dev he's devoted his life to serving the apostle. He's given himself to the needs and to the cares of Paul. And then you also would see, this is very, very, very sweet to see it, that the apostle would let us, that the Holy Spirit would let us see this through the apostle. Verse 23, we would see that Paul communicates that he needs Timothy. And I think that's important for us as a reader, as an observer of the text. We, put, we, we can come along with a guy like Paul sometimes and, and we just think, man, there's, there is a bulldog of a missionary. And I think that would be a, a good, accurate way to describe a guy like Paul. Endured, stayed the course, went to hard places, went to risky places, put his life at risk. Everything about him was just determined to go. But it also shows us his need for other people. That he's not an island unto himself. That he cannot exist without the companionship of others. So Paul communicates this to the church in Philippi in verse, number, in verse 23 where he says, I hope to send him immediately as soon as, I, as, as soon as I see how things go with me. I think that's revealing to us that Paul's acknowledging he has some needs that need attention. He needs to have this this brother of his, this son, if you will, of his, tend to some of his own needs. He wants to send him, and he wants to get him to them immediately. But oh, how he needs to have some, some ministry unto himself. Now those verses 19 through 23, primarily focused, uh, through, well, through verse 24, where he's focused primarily upon the servant Timothy, Paul does say in verse 24, I trust in the Lord that I myself will be able to come to you shortly as well. 
So again, through the work, the sweet, blessed work of the Holy Spirit, we see the person of Paul, perhaps as sweet as we can see in any of his letters, in any of his endearing ways that he would communicate his desire to be with the church. But he can't be. I mean, it's not because he woke up one day and decided, I don't feel like going. It's because he literally, he literally just can't go there. He's under house arrest. And so we see this sweetness. Another thing that I think is apparent here, we have the book of Acts that helps us, that historical book of the advancement of the gospel into the, into the modern day Turkey region and then as it begins to spread even un, into the southern regions of Europe and Paul's great desire to not only take the gospel to Rome but to even to eventually, if God would allow, to take the gospel as far as Spain. His great desire for this while he's in prison He's taken advantage of, and, he, and I, I think we can make a strong argument that Paul considers his imprisonment as an ordained work of God. Even though the desire and the craving in his life is to continue being advancing it into new territories, into new places, that here Paul is forbidden, arguably by the work of the Holy Spirit, from advancing new, new geographical distances, but limited to, to being under house arrest in the city of Rome. Well, one other thing I think, by the aid of the book of Acts, that we also know is that Paul is also in great concern about what's happening in the churches while he's under house arrest. We have, we have other letters that Paul writes while he's in Rome. We have other letters that Paul writes on his missionary journeys. And we know that there are times whenever Paul is away from a church that his concern for them increases. Not, not just because he longs to be in fellowship with them like he does this church in Philippi, but because like the churches in the Colossi or in, in the Galatian region, that while Paul is, is unable to be there, there are some disruptors, if you will. We'll call them disruptors. That while Paul can't be there to confront them personally, there are some disruptors who come into the churches and begin to teach false doctrines. They begin to, to just very subtly bring in strange and foreign doctrines. And Paul can't correct them immediately. And I think that that's part of Paul's great desire to want to be out of prison. So can you imagine? You, you have a great desire and you're hearing word of disruptors who are coming in and they're undoing, they're attempting to undo what you've been establishing and creating in the planting of churches throughout the whole region. And what a great desire that that would be inside of him. I think that this is part of the ministry that Timothy is serving to Paul. Not, 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 not just serving as a counselor to Paul, but Timothy has freedom to come and go. Epaphroditus has freedom to come and go. And he longs to hear word and to send word. Paul wants to hear, hey, how are things going in Philippi? And so he sends one of the messengers and they come back and share a word. And, 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 and he wants to know what's happening in Colossae. He wants to know what's happening in Ephesus. He wants to know what's happening in this large stretch of places where they've planted the church in modern day Turkey, in the, in the, in the, in the Galatian region. So he has these messengers coming back and forth and he hears word and even as far south as Corinth where Paul knows and the, the, in, in the mixings and the comings, all of this isn't happening in this one particular arrested moment. But when Paul's away from these churches, his ability to hear word and communicate back through letter form or through messengers, here's what's happening so that Paul can send a correcting letter, Paul can send an encouraging letter, Paul can send a messenger Who's, who's seen him personally and send word of encouragement. and They too can come back and say, Oh Paul, it's good news for you. The church in Philippi, as they continue to gather together, they do so without grumbling or disputing. That's sweet news for a guy like the Apostle Paul, who's hearing other kinds of news, news from other churches. There's disruptions. There's complainings going on. They're, they're not living blameless and innocent lives. So what a sweet news for Paul to hear this from Timothy. And 
So I, I bless the Lord for verses 19 through 24 that lets us see the, the relationship between Paul and the church, between Timothy and the church, and the relationship between Paul and Timothy. It's sweet, it's sincere, it's authentic. And I would, I would make the argument that it's necessary for everyone involved. And then we come to verse 25, and we're introduced to this, this individual by the name of Epaphroditus. Now this is, this is perhaps strange in the flow of the text where Paul in his referring to Timothy as there's no one like Timothy. No, no one I could trust you with this. No one else I would feel like I've done a good service to you than by sending Timothy to you. And then verse 25, we get a second class uh, type of person, Epaphroditus. Uh, I, I, don't, I use the term second class in a... In, in, in not, not to describe that that's how Paul sees Epaphroditus because we see that he considers him a, a fellow worker, a brother in verse 25. First of all, he considers him a brother. Then he considers him a fellow worker. And then he calls him a fellow soldier. Three things that Paul says strongly about the character of Epaphroditus. And then we learn this, that he's essentially serving as the footman from Philippi to Rome. He's the messenger. He's the one who's bringing news. The, the primary one. And in, in this workings of doing this, there is a time while Epaphroditus is with Paul that you get the sense that he's grown homesick. Epaphroditus wants to be back home in Philippi. You see, you see the, the, the tinting of that in verse 26 where he says to the church in Philippi that in referring to this brother, this common brother, this fellow worker, this fellow soldier, in verse 26, he, because he was longing for you all and he was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Uh, oh, if, if, if we just stopped there and, and we just looked at that, we could, well, we, even the first part of verse 27, this was not just a, a common cold that he had. Not, not to suggest that a common cold doesn't feel like the death. Um, but this is a serious sickness. And we don't know specifically what it is. We don't know. We, we, we certainly can conclude that it was serious enough that led unto death. And uh, argument can be made, well, nearly anything you got sick of in these days would lead to death. And that's possibly uh, a pretty accurate thing to say. But this sickness was directly related to the advancing work of the gospel. Which shows us something very beautiful about Epaphroditus. Is that his illness is not just something that he, that he conducted by communal passing through regions where the, where the cold was break out. Or that he had an allergic reaction or he had allergies. This is a serious sickness. And the church in Philippi has heard word. We don't know who, he or who they heard word from. There were likely other messengers, other people sending letters, other eyewitnesses coming and going. And in this, someone has reported back to the church at Philippi, while in one of these extended times that Epaphroditus has stayed with the apostle, that he's sick. And he wants to be at home. Not because he wants his mom's chicken soup, because he doesn't feel so good. But he's longing to be at ease from the pain and the suffering that he's currently existing. His, sick, his sickness was so severe that it was even leading unto death. And it even sounds from Paul's description of it that they expected him to die. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only, Paul says, but also on me. Not because Paul was afraid that, hey, if this guy doesn't get well, I might get what he's got. But it shows us Paul's need for companionship of fellow ministers in the field. Paul described this. Had, had he died, it would have been sorrow upon sorrow. Sorrow upon sorrow. What's his first sorrow? We don't know. Was it the fact that his brother, that his fellow worker, that, this, this, that, that this, this, this faithful soldier in the gospel work is sick, and then a sorrow added to that is that he might die from it? Or is it that Paul so longs to be with the church, but he can't. And then on top of that, his fellow brother, his fellow servant, his fellow soldier 
in the gospel work may die. Sorrow upon sorrow. Now listen, we, we get this at, at different levels, don't we? It's even perhaps possible you're here this day and there's sorrow laying on you. There's hardships, there's difficulties. And it's almost as though if one more thing happens, it will be another sorrow that will, that will increase the sorrow and the suffering that we're experiencing. This, would be, this, is, this is a manifold laying upon one hardship upon another. Difficulty upon difficulty. Disappointment upon disappointment. Hardship upon hardship. You get it, don't you? <laughs> Sometimes it's like that happens every day. A new hardship added to another hardship. An old sorrow that we can't deal, that we can't seem to get out of us, and a new hardship comes along the way. You get the kind of hardship that Paul's describing here. Well, there's there's two things I think that are of benefit for us. We get to see that Paul really is a real person. He's suffering, he's, he's longing to be, he wants to be in a different place than he currently is. But not so much that he would ever drop down and lay down his gospel work. It's hard. It's difficult. And then to add to that, the sickness of a brother, a fellow worker, a soldier, he may die. And by the grace of God, by the mercy that God extended, otherwise it would have been sorrow upon sorrow upon my life. So verse 28, therefore, Paul says, I've sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I will, have, I, will have, I will be less concerned about you. You can see that Paul's concerned about the church in Philippi because they've heard word that Epaphroditus is sick and his sickness is unto death and he's concerned that they're bothered and they're troubled, they're anxious over his sickness. And the hardship is multiplied and increased. So Paul's counting it a joy that he might be able to get Epaphroditus to them quickly because he's no longer sick. He's well now. And they would be encouraged to see him. So he wants him to be there for his sake and for their sake. He's homesick, Epaphroditus. He wants to be with them. And they want to see him. They want to hear news of how he's doing. And Paul knows this would be good. It would be good to see him. It will be good for you to be able to not just, not just be able to hear word that he is well, but you would actually see his countenance. You would actually see that he is well. Verse 28, in Paul's desire of his eagerness of wanting to get Epaphroditus there, that they might rejoice and that they would be less concerned about him and that they, that they would be, that he would have less concern about them. Then verse 29, receive him in the Lord with all joy. Now this is that common, consistent theme through the book. And from beginning through end, interlaced in the hardships, the sorrows, the difficulties, the sickness, the, 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 the persecutions, the sufferings in the midst of the, the common interspersing of the Holy Spirit is consistent with Paul speaking about joy. What a foreign thing for the ears of men to hear that when we're in suffering that joy would be as well the triumph over the hardships that we're facing. So in that 29th verse there where the apostle is saying, receive him with joy. Receive him in the Lord with all joy. Be pleased. Give him a royal welcome. Give, give, give him the, the welcome that you give, that you see those around you who would give to a welcomed soldier coming in from the war field. He's essentially saying, welcome the brother like that. Celebrate that he's with you. And Paul gives them this charge. He says, hold men like him in high regard. So let's stop for just a minute and think of this. We know this can be a really risky thing for us to do, to put any person in position of lifting them up that we might make them arrogant and proud and boastful of their work. 
But Paul does give the church in Philippi a charge to hold men like him. And Paul's very specific. He doesn't say, hey, hold all men in high regard like, like this. He says, hold men like him in high regard. Men like who? A man we've never heard of before who has high character. A man who is devoted to the work. He's given himself. He gives his resources for the work. He, we, we can make strong argument that he does give his resources. He gives his finances to the work because he's a fellow soldier. This is language that any, any person in this era and in this day would understand. That, it, that if you're a soldier in any army, you're, you're likely not getting paid by any government to be a soldier. You might get a few benefits along the way, but largely, you're self-funded. You are a self-funded soldier. That means you're completely bought into the cause. So much so that you're devoting your income to the work to keep yourself in the field. This is the kind of individual that the Apostle is saying, hold men in high regard who behave like soldiers. They're all in. They're, they're not just standing back on the peripheral. They're not just watching the battle from, from a distance. They are actually engaged in it and everything about them is devoted and committed to the cause. This is the kind of guy that Epaphroditus was. And we get that from the language of the text. Paul doesn't describe him as a fellow soldier for no reason. The Holy Spirit wants us to get this. He wants us to understand this. That he's in this all the way. He's not just a part of the cause when it's convenient. He's not just part of the cause when he's well. He's not just part of the cause whenever it benefits him. He's part of the cause all the way in. When it's hard, when he's sick, when it's not popular, when it's not convenient. He's committed to the work. Hold men like him in high regard. Let me say this in regards to this. This is why I think there is benefit in your households that you read biographies of men of old. Oh, you got, you got a Bible full of men that you could read about and study about, and you should. You should never devote yourself to the reading of other godly men outside of the Bible at the expense of not reading about them in the Bible. But can I commit to you the benefit of reading biographies of godly men throughout the ages and godly women throughout the ages? I think it will be a benefit to, you, to the ears of everyone in your household. It might be even of such that it would be good to assign essay reports and homework assignments to your children. Now every child in the room, all of a sudden I've got their attention. What are you talking about, preacher? I have it hard enough in my home and now you're adding to it. I would, I would say it would be of benefit that everyone is learning about faithful men and women of old. You ought to get to know men of the, of the ages past like, like, like Polycarp. Oh, there would be a good test for us someday. Who knows who Polycarp is? You need to, not right, not right now, as some of you are, are inclined to do, just pick up your phone and Google Polycarp. Uh, you're behaving like millennials when you do that, by the way. So stop it! Uh, Google it later. <laughs> and, and we'll all behave like millennials later, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll Google Polycarp. Who in the world is Polycarp? And who names their child Polycarp? Nobody I know today names their child Polycarp. They would be the mocking stock of all the neighborhood if you did so. But what about a guy like Polycarp? Martyred for the gospel in the first century of the church. I would say to every household, go home today and find out who Polycarp is and teach this, this man's ways in your households. Throughout the ages, find them. We're in a significant year of a fi 500 years ago, one of the greatest 
movements in the modern church has happened. Martin Luther, what an amazing historic figure. Interwoven with all kinds of problematic issues. But I think Paul would say to the church, hold men like Martin Luther in high regard. Look at him and follow his examples. Now I would say, don't follow everything that Martin Luther did because he called a lot of people a lot of nasty, nasty, nasty names. But that was a different scenario and perhaps was even needed. But go and find out who is a person like Martin Luther who would, who would be a part of John Calvin, who would be a part of bringing and issuing into the modern church one of the greatest Reformation movements that the church has ever needed and maybe perhaps even today that we might be in need of that same kind of a type of a Reformation in our own day. Keep digging through. Find out who an Amy Carmichael is. Make sure your daughters know who Amy Carmichael is. Don't let your daughters escape from your home without knowing who Amy Carmichael is. Make sure they know who people like Annie Armstrong and, and Lottie Moon are. Make sure these aren't just names that you read about in your church bulletin from time to time concerning a missions offering. Devote yourselves into knowing who these kinds of people are. Find out who a George Mueller is. Make sure that your children, make sure that you understand what an individual like this is and hold them in high regard. We're never going to place them in superior position to Christ our Lord. But know them. I think it would be, because Paul is saying in this day to the church in Philippi, I commit to you men like him. Men of character. Women of character. I commit you to hold them into high regard. Know them and welcome them. Give them a royal welcome into your home. It would, it would be perhaps today equivalent to me, and to, to me saying to you, hold someone like Mark and Wendy Hoshisaki. To, uh, hold them in high regard. You, you met them about a month ago. Some missionaries to Japan. Nobody's writing books about them. Nobody is throwing welcome home parties for people like them. Paul's saying, hold this man in high regard. Give him the royal welcome when he, come, when he shows up. Welcome him. My expectation that this room would be filled with men and women like Epaphroditus whom, if the Lord tarries and decades and decades later go by, or even in the current moment of time right now, as the increased suffering upon the church increases, there, this room would be filled with people the world will never know, but that Paul the Apostle in an equivalent way would say, hold these men in high regard. Now listen. Listen. You can't just say that because you're a man of this church that you're to be held in high regard. Paul makes it very clear the kind of man, the kind of woman, the kind of character that he's saying, hold this person in high regard. What kind of person? A fellow brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier. One who's completely committed to the cause. One who's all the way in. He may not be preaching every week. He may not be doing everything that's always needed at the church. But whenever need arises, he's willing to commit himself to the cause. Even so much as while the advancing work of the gospel is taking place, his very life is at risk. He said, Paul, well, you're making too much of this Epaphroditus. I haven't finished reading the Scripture, have we? Verse 30. Because he came close to death. Why? For the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. I would say this, present face-to-face -face with you, when the Lord, and if the Lord ever allows for you to meet the man by the name of Alex Villard, you welcome him and you give him a royal welcome. 
Whenever there was a time when your church people needed you and you couldn't go there. Lord raised up a young man by the name of Alex Villard. I say to you, hold men like Alex Villard in high regard. And if the Lord would be so kind as to give you an opportunity to ever meet Him on this planet, you give Him the royal welcome, will you? Will you, will, you, will you give your word that you will honor men like that in high regard? And may it serve as an example to every man, woman, boy and girl in this room. This is what it looks like to be all the way sold in. He came, this Epaphroditus, he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was deficient. Now, that's not a slight against the church in Philippi. It was simply because they couldn't. They couldn't just all pick up one day and go and go to the, the, the house arrested, the, 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 the house prison that Paul was in in Rome. But when they couldn't, God raised up another. And he gave service Paul says it very clear. He did so in your inability or your unable condition. He did it to me. And Paul's saying, do this. Put these kind of men in front of you. Give them the royal welcome. Put these kinds of women of high regard among you. Listen, dear East Side, the world needs you to be different than the world. The world needs churches filled with men and women, boys and girls like Epaphroditus. There's not a lot of glory for a guy like Epaphroditus. No books have been written about him. No statues have ever been erected because of him. But the Apostle himself says something about this man that he says about no other. Wow. All the way committed to the cause. So Lord, perhaps there's, there, there's a more eloquent way to end this piece of text. But what a sweetness that it lays upon us today.